Friends, you're looking at Dave King. I'm still Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show, and Dave and I have a long history, but I was thinking, he's, he's in New York and today, and I thought, we should talk about Mark Levinson. You worked for Mark Levinson. I did. Iconic. A pioneer of high-end audio. The man, the legend. And there's a good reason for all of that. He had a strong personality. He's, I mean, reputation aside, just from my personal experience, a very, very bright person. And uh, very creative, mm -hmm. uh, very entrepreneurial, very driven. And, um, you know, he knew what he wanted and he really went after it. So when, and you, you weren't there at the beginning at the Mark Levinson company, you were there for, no. his, I guess, the second company, Cello. That's right, yeah. And was John Curl still the designer? No, uh, he had, he had. Um, Who was I know that is. Yeah. Tom uh, Colangelo right. was right, his right. primary designer, and then right. Paul. I can't remember his last name right now. Was was a secondary. Okay. Guy. But Tom and, Colangelo. And, and, yeah. and those two designed uh, cello. Okay. The speakers as well. Um, I'm not sure if they had as much to do with the speakers, honestly. Um, that I don't remember where the initial idea from that came from, which is basically just lashing two uh, Acoustic Research LS ones were okay, they okay. together uh, mm -hmm. in a stacked pair, and they they were so heavy they had to make granite uprights. The, the stands weighed you know hundreds of pounds, right. and when they were assembled and put together, the whole thing probably weighed you know each side probably weighed 600 pounds or something. So this is the late 80s. So you didn't like scotch them into place. You yeah. Know? You had no, to kind no of scotching. know where to put them. No scotching speak. <laughs> so this is the late 80s, was to set the time frame for yeah. this, right? Yeah. And um, it was a townhouse. On well, so what I did for Mark was um, I, I had been working for Dave Wasserman, one of the great guys stereo in exchange, audio. Yeah, yeah, Stereo Exchange. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was kind of doing more what I wanted to do, and he wanted me to do other things, so we kind of had a parting of the ways, a, you know, cordial parting. And um, I was setting up uh, turntables. You, I don't know if you remember this. I had an ad in the New York Times, oh. and um, that was going okay. And then Mark called me one day. He said, come up to New Haven. I want to talk to you. So he, hired, he gave, offered me a job. I took it. And basically, he wanted me to do two things. One, set up the New York showroom. Because okay. he had a complete line of electronics and speakers at that point, a system, and he wanted to present that. And, you know, do installations. So I traveled around doing installations. Oh, so if somebody in Colorado systems. bought a system, you would be in, you'd be the setup guy? Really? Yeah, oh, that's go, cool. I'd go out and set it up. And that was, that was actually a lot of fun. That uh -huh. was, the, to me, that was more fun than selling equipment. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, that whole thing was, first of all, there's no pressure about the selling. Yeah. But you just got to make the customer happy that's and all. make sure it all works. So. And every, everywhere you went was interesting because, you know, you'd be in a you know, high-end mastering studio in Switzerland right. or you'd be in a, like a real fancy Parisian apartment. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Just, it was just a fun job. Wow. Yeah, it was a good job. Yeah. So, so you weren't in New York with, uh, or actually Mark wasn't in New York most of the time. No, he was in Connecticut in, in, in his New Haven factory. And I was kind of manning the showroom while that, while that lasted. Uh-huh. Wow. So, so uh, do you get any good stories about interact? Because he's so quirky. You know, well, he, he he's you know he's eccentric. You know the way a lot of bright people are. He's mm. you know he's he's uh, everybody who's you know driven and smart is you know in their own way, and he mm. definitely is a you know example of that. Um, not that many stories. Uh, I mean, we just had a working relationship, uh -huh. and uh, you know I, I can't I can't tell too many. Yeah, I understand. I can't talk yeah, out of school get sued. too much. No, it's not sued. about even being sued. It's yeah. just, you know, kind of respecting his presence. Yeah, I understand. And, you know, we, we're not, we haven't been in contact really for quite a long time. I understand he's living on a small island outside of Venice now. Oh, doesn't that make sense? Yeah. With a, you know, kind of a, you know, bespoke, very high-end kind of boutique company. And he Ooh. manufactures uh, components to order by a company in Switzerland. It might be Stellavox. I'm not sure uh, who makes them for him. I didn't know that. And uh, yeah, I can just see him on a you know one of those little you know motor launches going from Murano to Venice. To, yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, that's so cool. I, you know, if that's true, and I heard that from somebody who knows him pretty well, so yeah, that I it mean, seems like he's you know might have found his his spot where I, he's. Uh, I really see him 
at the at the very beginning of the high end audio world. You know him, and uh, well, Mike K because it was his new. That's true. Dealer, yeah, him and Mike K were. Yeah, they were. They were and a team. They're by extension. Yeah. Um, uh, at the absolute sound and Harry Pearson. That's a good point. You know, I wonder if you could have launched that crazy expensive two thousand dollar preamp when everything else was five hundred or less. If right. it hadn't been Mike K. Oh fronting, no, he, yeah, that was yeah. It, that was integral. It, it had yeah. to be him. Had to be Mike. And K, yeah. um, you know, it was the upper upper east side, and he had right. lots of super wealthy customers. Yeah. And it was a great story. And the bottom line is the bottom line. It was much more expensive than other preamps at the time period. Right. But it was better. I mean, it wasn't just people didn't buy it just go, oh, well, I want the most expensive. No, they knew, like, why is it so expensive? Listen to it. And if you think it's worth it, you buy it. If you don't think it's worth it, you don't buy it. I don't think these things are more complicated than that, you know? No. And, no, uh, I, I don't remember who built it for him, but it might have been some company that just built, you know, hospital electronics or military electronics or something like that. And those, that stuff's not cheap, you know. You're just making a few, like fifty or a hundred of them or something. Yeah. And so they they're they're as expensive as they are. You know, and, and you know what's else it's funny to think about is the shape of the of the volume control and and all the switches that round. What would you even? If you know what it looks like, you know what it looks like. But so many other companies copied that that knob shape. That's true. That round That's knob true. And that might have been one part. of Mark's own as kind of aesthetic flourishes. I don't mm -hmm. really know the story on that. Or it could have been something that was on a piece of hospital. It, it could have been an off the shelf part, right? But it just looks so cool. And of it course, did. by the time you entered the picture, a cello, the cello palette with the feel. He had of taken those the knob. Oh my God! New heights. <laughs> yeah, the volume control was well, is a stepped attenuator. But people it, just talked about those knobs <laughs> because no, because the clicks the ch -ch 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 -ch, yeah, no, as you were, turned it, they were they were the real a real tactile pr pleasure to use. Oh know? my God! And, it was uh, amazing. I, I used to say to him, "Hey, could you just sell me the knob?" Yeah, I just want that. I don't need the rest of your stuff. Right. I just so want now the you'd knob. have to buy a whole pallet, and then you could take the knobs off yeah. if you want to. So the pallet, we should talk a little bit about that. So because that was a revolutionary idea, yeah. basically an equalizer, yeah. four band equalizer, right? six band, six band, okay, six bands. And I'm trying to remember who designed it. It was um, a very, very well known designer. It just slips my mind at the moment. But basically. The idea of that, you know, you, all these graphic equalizers had, you know, 24 bands, and you, you know, you'd mess things up. Yeah, you using needed them. a pro to use. I those mean, you, you didn't know, how, well, you, and it just would make the sound worse, and you couldn't make it better, and you finally right. just gave up, and put it right. in the closet. But this thing, basically, there was no way to screw the sound up with it. Everything you did made it sound better, and then you knew when to stop or to back off and find right. that perfect yeah, place Yeah, it was for very it. easy for a uh, consumer. Anybody to could use it. Yeah. Anybody could use it. You could, you, a nine-year-old could use it, a, right. you know, whoever could use it. And um, it compensated for tonal deficiencies and anomalies and, yeah. you know, and everything had, I mean, had, everything has them, room speakers, recordings. But, but Mark's observation, which was so true, was that just play, you know, three different albums, the Beatles and Keith Jarrett and Sonny Rollins, the tonal balances of these records are wildly different Absolutely, from each other. Yeah, They're recorded yeah. in different studios, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, you know, one can sound bright, the next one can sound dull. And we just, audiophiles just live with it. He said, well, right. why should you live with it? Why not have it? Because didn't he sell it so you could set up the pallet right next to your listening chair so you could just tweak it? Cables from the yeah. system to not right next to your chair yeah. so you could just kind of like, as you were listening yeah. from one record to the next, you could just tweak it so that it was perfectly balanced. Uh -huh. And some records benefited tremendously and right. some just basically didn't really need much. And it, and it was, if you remember, $10,000. When ten thousand dollars was a lot of money, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, it's not and anymore. You got ten thousand to lend me. Yeah, I, uh, I could now use, you could buy the. I could the use the you could buy the shit Loki for uh, one hundred and twenty nine dollars. I have it's that. A, it's an equalizer. I have that. It's the little mini cello yeah. palette. That's what it is to me. Yeah. Right. See, that's the advantages of twenty first century. Yep. But uh, they they sold. I, I sound by singer where I work was briefly a cello dealer, and we did sell pallets. Yeah. Did you sell many of them? Uh, considering the price, yeah, I think we did. That's good. Meaning maybe six or seven. Yeah, or you might have been his biggest dealer. I don't yeah. know. So, um, but anyway, I think we've done it. Unless, uh, am I missing something? Should we nah. wrap, prattle on? Nah. More, more <clears throat> maybe we'll maybe we'll we'll wrap up by saying maybe we'll we'll hear from Mark Levinson yet again one or day. Or his lawyer. We'll, 
for enough from this. Okay, I'm pretty, okay, pretty sure about that. But you mean he might have a pallet just sitting around? If he's, and say, if he's watching, but, hey Mark, good to see you. Hey, hey yeah, hey Mark, <laughs> just talk a little faster. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for doing this, Dave. My pleasure. Uh, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily, Sh Daily Show, which does come up yeah, daily, as in seven days a week. You know, the Daily Show on Comedy Central is actually four days a week, <clears throat> which makes me at least 50% better, I think. To uh, me, to me, 100% better. Oh, damn. I'm okay. biased. Well, thanks. Anyway, thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.